You talk about police officers needing to make split second life and death decisions in tight quarters. Well, that is all on display right here. The police chief calling what happened a tragedy. I want to give you another reference point to show you how much this water has gone down. Remember my story shot just four hours ago, the water rushing over County Road 76. Take a look at it now. Bone dry. The hope now is these homeowners along the Snake River and its tributaries are now out of danger. The NTSB, the FAA, we are told, will be in charge of the investigation into what went wrong for this vintage aircraft. And as we pull out and you take a look at the fencing, this isn't just any fencing. This is barbed wire these guys climbed over and climbed through. But they said when they saw that pilot literally on fire, they knew they had to get out onto that airfield to help out. A sniper and his killing field. And you're right, we've just arrived here at the Las Vegas International Airport. And let me tell you, a city that is known for partying, for entertainment, for fun, tonight is reeling. We got the wind. Jennifer mentioned some, some lighter snow, but it's uh, falling in a pretty good clip. And you're right, the digging out is just beginning. In fact, I've managed to stop Ryan over here. Ryan, uh, remove snow. And what you said, you're just delirious. You've been working on that. Talking about a senseless and unprovoked attack on a beloved family pet. You mentioned him, Porter. We're here on Northwest Boulevard, a busy stretch through Plymouth. And middle of the afternoon on Wednesday, police and the owners believe somebody walked up to this fence, stuck a pellet gun right between the wooden slats here, fired a single and deadly shot striking Porter. And you heard from the owner of one of the restaurants in town, the types of people who come here. It could yeah. be the judge from Dakota County driving down from Hastings, or it could be the pig farmer just right. out uh, behind us out in left field. So it's a special place, Meesville. About 136 people now live here, according to the mayor. There's a ballpark, there's a church, and then there are two restaurants on opposite sides of Highway 61. Really, just a short walk to town. You can see we're flying right towards downtown. Well, thank you for joining us. Jim and Don off tonight. I am Paul Bloom answering the call from the bullpen. Well, in the quest for Stanley Cup, fortunately, you don't have much time to feel sorry for yourselves or lament lost opportunities. That is a very good thing for the Wild, considering how they gave away game one to the Avalanche the other night in heartbreaking fashion. The fire chief did say there is a possibility that someone could still be alive inside the building the way it collapsed. Right. Two floors collapsed down. There's still the possibility that someone could be alive in a pocket of air uh, down below. But obviously that effort going on right now after a very traumatic and difficult day here at the school. Witnesses report getting mere seconds, a warning that there was an odor of gas in the building. Some headed for the door when the giant explosion rocked the Minnehaha Academy upper school. We just heard a loud explosion and just got out as quickly as possible. There was just a really loud bang. The lights went out and the ceiling started to collapse. Some windows exploded and ceiling tiles were falling down. As soon as my daughter got up to go out into the hallway, the explosion happened and kind of blew her back into the office where we were. There's people trapped on the ceiling and we were trying to get to them, but we couldn't really get to them. Emotions were overwhelming. His loved ones waited to see who made it out and who didn't. Philip Day could hardly believe his eyes once he and his family evacuated safely. The explosion was pretty massive. Um, I don't think, you know, just because you're, you're, you're in a close quarters, not exactly sure. It wasn't until we got out here. The, the, it made sense. When you, when you felt it and heard it and the debris and everything that we saw. Investigators report that a gas leak appeared to be the root cause. Contractor Master Mechanical had pulled a permit with the city recently to do some, quote, gas piping work at the school. It's not clear what happened to spark the explosion and fire. One body was recovered from the rubble mid-afternoon. Meantime, tactical rescue and recovery crews were readying to finally get into the flattened portion of the building to locate a second person who was unaccounted for throughout the day. But the building's structural integrity remained a huge concern. These types of collapses, you don't really know where there were potentially void spaces created from that collapse that they could be in, so we have to be very precise. And remarkable, after seven or eight hours, they still can't get inside. It is that mm -hmm. delicate, that work going to continue into the night as they search desperately for this janitor. Thank you, Paul. Yep. This video was played for jurors. It shows Colin Osborne in a motel lobby not long after what would turn into that deadly encounter with Hussein Al Nadi. Shirtless, Osborne appears to be potentially boasting, maybe mimicking a knockout blow that dropped the victim in this case. But while some on the jury absolutely saw a murderer in this video and the rest of the evidence, 
others had to be convinced that he was guilty of anything. When everyone wasn't all on the same page, um, yeah, I, I kind of got a little upset. Yeah, and, you know, there were some words to be said. After a week-long trial in Dunn County, Wisconsin, Foreman Ben Brisky was absolutely convinced Colin Osborne was guilty of felony murder. Half of his fellow jurors agreed at the outset of their deliberations. But turns out behind closed courthouse doors, a couple on the panel of 12 initially wanted to acquit the Minneapolis man on all counts, including the lesser charge of aggravated battery in the death of UW Stout student Hussein Al-Nadi. Brisky was shocked. They said uh, it wasn't beyond reasonable doubt, so it was hard for them to get to aggravated battery as well. So they, it was going to be a not guilty, which I wasn't going to let that go. It would have went to a hung jury because I would have never Seven. backed down to a not guilty plea. It says, we, the jury, find the defendant, Colin Osborne, guilty of aggravated battery. In the end, Brisky and the others found compromise through what's been described as intense, hours-long deliberations. Brisky eventually signed this verdict form, passing on felony murder, and the holdouts agreed Osborne was indeed guilty of something in the deadly October 2016 altercation outside a downtown Menominee pizza joint. One female juror visibly shaken as that verdict was read last month. Oh, there was tons of emotion, tons of emotion. People were angry, people were crying. There, it, it, was, it was sad and it, there was highs and lows. and. You know, it was, it took a toll on every single person um, in, in the jury room. There was a, several sleepless nights afterwards where uh, I'd say the deliberation was actually even harder than the trial itself. Prosecutors had argued at trial that Osborne was angry and itching for a fight that Halloween weekend. And Al Naughty, extremely drunk himself, seen here stumbling out of a bar earlier in the evening, ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time. A knockout blow would leave Al Naughty with a cracked skull. A Saudi national passed away some 36 hours later. And the truth is that the defendant saw Mr. Alnadi and formed the intent to batter Mr. Alnadi. That is to cause him physical pain, punch Mr. Alnadi, carry out that intent. But the defense countered that this official death report showed, quote, no anatomical findings to indicate that Alnadi had been in a fight, no facial injuries noted. Their position was there might have been a confrontation with some pushing and shoving, but it was Al Nadi and his friend who were the aggressors. I don't care if you don't like my client. You're entitled to not like my client, but you're not entitled to ignore the facts of this case. During his closing argument, Osborne's attorney also raised the specter that lax medical care at the hospital may have ultimately cost Al Nadi his life. There was a, a lot of heated discussion about that, I guess. Fellow juror Darren Falk also believed Osborne was guilty of felony murder, that he threw a punch, and that the punch is what ultimately killed Al Nadi. Everybody agreed there was a punch. Whether the punch caused the death, that was some, you know, disagreement, I guess. One piece of evidence both jurors pointed to, this surveillance video taken at a Wisconsin motel nearly two hours after the confrontation. This is the first time we were able to show it on television. There's no audio, but a shirtless and animated Osborne appears to be mimicking the alleged blow that dropped Al Nadi. But the front desk employee had testified that Osborne was bragging about a scuffle with a bouncer that night. Investigators would report that no such encounter could be corroborated. In your mind, is that him mimicking Al Nadi going down? Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is um, that. To me, that was uh, straightforward evidence right there on top of everything else. So now attention turns to the July sentencing. District Attorney Andrea Nodolf estimates that Osborne is looking at somewhere between three and seven years behind bars for the lesser aggravated battery count rather than the 24-year max he was potentially facing for felony murder. Both jurors tell me they are curious to see what happens. Both were offended by the defendant's actions in the immediate aftermath of the verdict. At one point, Osborne can be seen here mouthing to the jury that he didn't do it and then flashing some hand gestures at our camera after the verdict as if he had just claimed victory. Gang signs. Yeah, when I seen that on the news, that, um, that hit me to the core. That was like, man, we should have should have went all the way to the top because, and uh, you know, I don't know, but I would imagine he's going to do something like that again. Paul Bloom, Fox 9.
Well, a Minnesota woman has lost her husband in a crash that police believe was caused by a distracted semi-truck driver. Tonight, she's on a mission to get motorists to put down their phones. Fox 9's Paul Bloom has her emotional story. He had a zest for life. He loved to live. Jess Bursick explained that her family has been robbed of so much. It's very overwhelming. She lost a husband, their son and stepchildren, a rock star dad. And my seven-year-old son, Ian, is not going to have a father to continue doing the things that they love to do together. It was two weeks ago and Rob Bursick was on his way home to Wisconsin from a Minneapolis hospital. The couple's young son had a bad eye infection. Dad had spent the night and kissed his wife goodbye. Jess had no idea it would be their final farewell. And that's when I saw the vehicle, and it was devastating. Prosecutors have said Samuel Hicks was at the wheel of a semi, allegedly paying no attention to traffic on Highway 36. Hicks apparently never saw Rob Bursick's car at the stoplight. There was no attempt to brake. And Samuel, did you want to say anything at all to the Bursick family? They lost a father. Authorities have said video cameras on board the big rig captured the entire distracted driving incident. Hicks is now charged with criminal vehicular homicide and is out of jail, having posted his bond. Jess, meanwhile, had to explain it all to her son. When I initially told him the news, he, he started crying right away and asked um, when he was going to be able to get another dad and uh, um, that he wanted the semi driver to, to be in big trouble. Heartbroken and angry, Jess has decided to speak out to make sure her husband's death has meaning. It wasn't just some ordinary man that was killed. She wants people to see Rob Bursick, to see her shattered world, and to put down their phones. My husband's tragic death is going to be a message in a forward direction about texting and driving, and I think he would have some comfort in that. And Jess went on to tell me that she was outraged to learn that Samuel Hicks is apparently still taking in a paycheck from his employer, E.B. Brown. That's a large convenience store supplier based in Illinois. Hicks' attorney said in court recently that Hicks wouldn't be driving semi, but would continue to work in a distribution center. We've got the firm's full statement online now at fox9.com. Paul Blim, Fox 9.